Welcome to the Future of Tourism podcast. I'm David Peacock. Stop owning your own content. Young leaders are stepping up. Bring everyone to the table. And imagine their world anew. Jason Kirby is a reporter for the Globe and Mail in Canada. August this year, he wrote, and I quote, In the fall of 22, a remarkable innovation burst onto the scene with the power to reshape the world that has kick-started the next great productivity boom. Stanford prof Andrew Ning, who is also chief scientist at Beidou Research in Silicon Valley, called it the new electricity in terms of global impact. Jeanette Rausch, is the EVP of Marketing and Digital for New York City Tourism and Conventions. She spent more than two decades with industry-leading organizations and modern media agencies. Cody Chomiak is the VP of Marketing for Travel Manitoba. He was formerly VP Industry Engagement for Bandwango and a 2012 Destinations International 30 Under 30 recipient. Over the past two years, both of them have done a magnificent job of demystifying AI for all of us in our industry. They understand well the incredible impact that the new electricity will have on the future. Good morning, Cody. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Good morning. I am fantastic. I am uh, from Winnipeg, Manitoba, currently enjoying the tail end of our beautiful summer. And I am currently navigating the rapids that is AI which is a never dull moment, very exciting, and uh, a, a change in every every day, every hour, it seems. Good morning, Janet. How are you, Jeanette? Jeez, I did this. <laughs> Good morning, Jeanette Roush. <laughs> How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Uh, good morning, David. Uh, I am in New York City in beautiful Long Island City, Queens, overlooking Manhattan. It is a gorgeous, clear day, and I'm excited to geek out about AI. Okay, let's geek out about AI. You were here 10 months ago, and it's, and it seems like forever, but it was only 10 months. And in that time, so much has changed. We talked then about just the emergence of LLMs and how that had captured everyone's attention. At the time, you were doing a really brilliant job of just beginning to demystify this for people, get them to try it. Cody, you've been doing the same thing. I, I won't go into a big rehash here, but I will say that you're both prolific publishers on this on the internet and your stuff's been really helpful i've seen you at multiple shows you get asked to speak on this all the time so i'm gonna i'm gonna open up just by asking you this what's your key message in in that stuff because we're gonna then we're gonna drill into some really hard questions about what's the future so maybe you want to go first cody what's the what's your key message over the past two years on ai and, and how, how how are you dealing with it yeah, I think the biggest thing is that this isn't about tech adoption. This isn't a new CRM. Uh, this is an, a change management HR tool. And, and the key to doing this well is taking the fear out. I think there's a lot of anxiety and angst, and, and rightly so in many cases. But if people aren't excited and they're not seeing the advantages uh, to be able to dive in and start to play around with it, we're not going to get, you know, the top to bottom, bottom up approach. And is that literally how you thought about it? You looked at it and said, you know, I've got to get people to be more comfortable with this if we're going to use it. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about, you know, we go into a room and we flick on a light switch without thinking about it. We fire up our computer and fire up our email without thinking about it. And and yet somehow, you know, ta putting a prompt in chat GPT is is scary. So I think it really, you know, we don't have a, a VP of electrical, uh, you know, um, infusion in our office, right? Because electricity isn't everything. So it, it really just has to be a mindset that you adopt every single day to start to change your behaviors. Okay. So Jeanette, 10 months ago, we talked about changing people's behavior. What's just recap for us here for anyone who has said who lives under a rock and has never seen your stuff. What's your key message over the last 24 months? Keep chat GPT or quad or Gemini, one of the frontier models open in one of your browser windows. If you have two monitors, dedicate a monitor to AI and find one thing a day to test out that you haven't tried before because some of it is going to work and some of it won't work at all. Some of the things that don't work, maybe they're going to work in six months or a year as the models get stronger and smarter. But if you're not 
testing the limits of it, you don't get the opportunity to explore how it can help you. Okay, so there's your key messaging. Um, can I ask you both, um, think about this for a second, what's a practical example of the evolution of, of AI? And I'm gonna assume it's, it's, it's uh, narrative and, and, and language-based AI in your organizations. Is there a good example that you wanna talk about that could you know, shed some light on other people on what the on-ramp looks like? Who wants to go first? I can jump in. I, I have seen an enormous improvement over the past year in the work that we do for B2B, you know, communication documents, primarily board books, annual report, things that require 15 different people to send you a summary of what their work was over the past three months or over the past 12 months. And then somebody has to take that and put it all into one voice so that it has, you know, the professional B2B writing, you know, that's appropriate for your board or, you know, for your stakeholders. And so the inputs that I'm receiving are already, they're much cleaner, much better written. And then my ability, I wrote a GPT that allowed me to take this now much better language and just make it more consistent throughout the documents. And so things that would take months before can happen in days now. And it's been a big improvement for us. So let's unpack that a little bit because there's a, a level of complexity there. Um, you are not using GPT to go out into the internet and source unknown data. You're actually using a really specific data set, the stuff the people in your office write to contribute to this report. Right, and it's not like you can go to chat GPT and say, hi, write the member membership summary of what NYC Tourism did for our members over the last three months. That doesn't exist on the internet, so. You could, but it would try to write it. Yeah, oh, it would try to write it. It wouldn't be accurate or helpful. It wouldn't be a shortcut of any kind. So yeah, this yeah. is purely about, somebody still has to sit down and take all of the things that they did. Yeah. But now you could, you know, we did a partnership with Ghostbusters when they launched their new film back uh, early summer. And so you could, instead of trying to write out a formal paragraph about what did that partnership look like, in the GPT that I wrote, you can say, we did this with Ghostbusters, we built this kind of landing page, it got this many impressions, we did this to promote it, they did this to promote it. And you don't have to write it in any type of language at all. You can make it bullet points. You can make it segment, sentence fragments. And what you get back from the GPT reordering that is nearly suitable for publishing. We still, it's going to a copywriter and fact checker. It is going through five different people, touch this document and rewrite pieces. Mm -hmm. This is not the final step, but it makes getting to the final step a lot quicker. So uh, last question to this, because I wasn't going to belabor what you teach us all to demystify this, but I, I got to ask. So is it natural for you now to use um, your own data sets when you really want accurate answers, or do you still use it equally to go out into the internet and just um, troll for content? I'm not ever using chat GPT or a frontier model to go out and they're they're not built necessarily to go out into the internet or to find facts of any kind. I might use search GPT or perplexity along with Google to go hunting for facts, but then I'm going to take whatever I consider to be facts. I'm going to feed that into the frontier model. I'm going to say I'm writing this, use this information and you have to check to make sure that it did. But I wouldn't just trust, you know, what the probability, you know, that's built into the transformer thinks is supposed to happen next. Well, I, I appreciate that. Those guardrails are helpful. Okay. So, Cody, same thing. An example of travel manto, and I've heard you speak on a few of them from marketing to product mm -hmm. development. So take your pick. 100%, and I agree. We're using it in similar ways as Jeanette as well. I would say in, in addition to that, it's really about treating it like a coworker. So looking at it, for example, to stress test ideas. If you've got a job description, what is it missing? You know, asking it specific questions to provide better advice. And what we found is, is that the valuable intel uh, and content that we're bringing into team meetings now are much more rich because we might have a concept that we're starting to talk about, let's say supporting our airline access routes. 
Well, if our teams are each doing 15 minutes of pre-work, just going in and doing some brainstorming with ChatGPT or other, they're going to bring that into the meeting and we're going to have a whole host of additional insights to talk about that are going to make our meetings way more effective and efficient because we're no longer starting from scratch. You're starting actually at, you know, 50% and then you're now building on it. It's able to uh, answer or ask questions that you would maybe not have thought of. So even looking at it from you know, what's a risk perspective? What's a sustainability perspective? What's a DEI perspective? There's all these different angles that you can ask it to take as it relates to either a strategy or a piece of content. So, you know, from, from that perspective, I really look at it as this, this really cool office coworker that you can just bounce ideas off really quickly um, to either uh, be cynical or uh, poke holes in or provide additional intel. And then really practically speaking, just to speed up our time. So for example, you know, our videographer took all of the manuals for the camera, uh, loaded it into a custom GPT, and now he's able to say, you know, I'm, I'm flying a drone uh, at this time of day with this weather conditions, what are the settings that I need to have? And rather than having to look that up, he just puts in that query and it's gonna tell him what he needs to know based on that information that uh, we have. We've also been able to use it, um, use generative AI to up res our older footage into 8K, which is no great. It's, it's not inauthentic, but it's able to take really great shots that we still wanna use, that we can have up on a much bigger screen in a higher res format. So again, I think so many people look for this like, uh, grandiose vision, like I need to build this massive uh, database or I need to, I'm going to type in, write my strategic plan. And I found that the biggest changes are in the smallest wins because that's what starts to build people's confidence and get people excited about really unlocking the power that we have right now. So that's, you got me on one point there. I mean, it, I'm very, always very interested. And I have this mindset that, you know, AI is what we know because it's our data, but you talked about using it to do something that you don't know. You don't know. You used an airline example and you said, if the teams are there and they're coming into a meeting and they prep for 15 minutes. So what, what is, what, what comes to the table that you don't know, you don't know. It could be uh, questions that we hadn't thought of. It could be partners that maybe we didn't think to reach out to. It could be even looking at um, doing chat to do a competitive intelligence on maybe what some other destinations are doing. And of course, you know, if you're ever to move on those things, you always want to fact check those items. Some of them might be fictitious examples, but irregardless, it's, it's actually valuable in the sense of the meeting that you're being brought into, these ideas that are being presented you know, one of them is going to lead to something really great. The other piece that it's so good at is it's weaving ideas together. So if you had, let's say, airline example, uh, promoting the winter uh, season in Manitoba, uh, and we want it to include um, polar bears, as an example, it will weave those three concepts together. And we, you could say, give me 10 different approaches on how I might do that. Now, they might be ridiculous and, and outlandish but it's going to create a whole bunch of things that might then lead to a more interesting idea in that meeting. So rather than people coming to the meeting with an empty notebook, they're already coming with, with all of this Intel. Okay. It's kind of fascinating because a lot of the last 10 months since we last spoke about this, Jeanette has been about the practical application of AI and its impact on jobs. And it's basically, you know, the, the, the admonitions, it'll take hard jobs away. Not a lot of people are talking about its creativity, unless you're talking to, to the DALI people and stuff like that. Same thing Co Cody's talking about there. What's, what's one of those creative examples that you really loved at NYC? Uh, using it to help us put together campaigns. So we're getting ready for America 250, and we knew that we wanted to really stake a claim in a market in the Northeast here that is very much owned by Philadelphia and Boston and DC. So New York is not the very first place you think of when it comes to the birthplace of the nation. I mean, it's not last, but it's it's we don't have a Liberty Bell here. And so a year ago, using, you know, lesser versions of the models that are, you know, out today, it's like, okay, great. We want to help me build the creative brief so that our in-house creative team can do their best work. And so it became this year-long iterative process of, oh, I found a new piece of research online that might speak to the types of audiences that are interested in this type of tourism. 
And eventually it helped us, you know, create a brief, but then our creative team is like, great, we want to focus on, you know, how New York City is always making history. And we are, you know, all like if you can look at the Stonewall uprisings or look at contributions of, you know, women and indigenous people 250 years ago and not just tell the same stories because that's not interesting anymore. And so it helped create the brief that then our team built founded by NYC, which is celebrating the, the city as a foundry of innovation. And so then as we continue to work on this, I have everything in one giant PowerPoint document that if I need a little help moving forward, I can turn it into a PDF, upload it in the cloud and say, I'm working on new ideas for our partnership with the musical Hamilton. Can you help me think of a way that this could apply to, you know, the meetings market? How would business event planners, oh, the room where it happens. Yes, that would be a great name for a campaign. Let me look into that. So it's the more like information that you can have collected in one place as your source of truth that you can then use to bounce ideas, you know, with the language model. Like I have found that process to be really, really helpful. So with the two of you being in those organizations and, and um, paying close attention to this technology and leading it, are you having a halo effect on your peers? And my measure of this would be how many people have a second monitor open with AI in your organization? Is it is it happening, Jeanette? Is it happening, Cody? Yeah, I would say um, it's actually surprising. Some of the folks that were most resistant or fearful um, once we've started to work with them on just some easy wins just looking and to see their excitement level and their confidence level um we all have you know post-its that are at our desk saying have you used chat gpt uh today um and we really do we try to have a little scrums on just new ways or new wins or new innovative approaches that we've used um, but i think we're starting to see kind of that momentum coming in um, and then as well just in talking with our uh you know our stakeholders our board our industry we know that people are using it regardless, and we want to make sure that we're guiding an ethical use of AI, right? So I think it's really important for us to be talking about how we're using it and then also asking our partners, how are you using it to, to get that, again, that, that halo effect across the industry? Excellent. Jeanette, how many people have second monitor now? Did, they, did you get a slew of requests for second monitors? <laughs> No, I don't know about that. So I, I don't know who actually is keeping it up and open on their desks all the time, but like we're making training a big priority. And so we did for our membership, we did a training webinar back in June, which is now leading to, you know, like now the bids are reaching out to me to say, oh, we really enjoyed, you know, the webinar that you did. Would you be able to come to our next you know, bid meeting so you can then talk to those members about how to use these tools? which to me is super important because it's it's that trickle down effect. It's, you know, New York City doesn't have the world's biggest budgets. And so we need, you know, to go back to that old say, like work smarter, not harder. We're not going to be able to outspend everyone, but right. we can give everyone the tools to their, do their best possible work. And so I'm part of a training cohort called an AI Opener for Destinations. So there's a cohort in Europe with Group Now, and then Miles Partnership is doing the US version of the cohort. And I'm an expert advisor with that. And one of the benefits of being associated with this group is everything, all of the trainings they do are recorded. And so now we are, as you know, in the office, anybody who's interested in joining a training can log on once a week and we watch one of the videos together so that it's not just, hey, go on your own and watch this stuff. It's let's watch it as a group so that as questions come up, you have a set of peers that you can discuss it with. We have a Slack channel that we use for people to share ideas and questions and articles that they're reading. Our creative team is bringing in someone who's a specialist on the visual side in a few weeks because that's, not an area where I can contribute a whole lot. I am not a great visual person. So I'm like, I'm really excited to keep you know, pushing and exploring. And so as long as people are ex approaching this with excitement and not, oh God, here's something else I have to learn, something else I have to do at work, then 
and that's the place that we're at right now. It it keeps it fun and not like it's this horrible threat. Super on that one. Thank you so much. I will point out, we we said this is a recap of what you do. You do all of this to entreat us towards the, the opportunity. Um, let's get into the little bit deeper understanding this. You both spend a lot of time thinking about the future of this and where it's going. And um, those aren't throwaway statements by by Andrew Ning, like it's, it's the new electricity. It really is. Okay, so uh, to give us a context to talk about that, there's an article in in focus wire uh i guess it was last month about the role of dmos in effectively helping their partners use ai you were quoted quite a bit in it jeanette um funny thing happened on the way to the forum as they say the other day i was talking to a peer of mine a guy named gabe goche who is an independent uh data scientist he's a really cool guy from canada and he said you ever heard of jeanette roosh and i said well yes i actually have and he said, well, I responded, you know, about it to uh, one of her posts about the role of DMOs helping uh, um, their, their constituents and stakeholders use AI. And I would talk about the need for data sets to be more accurate if we're going to base this thing. And it's very positive. And I said, well, that doesn't surprise me. But then I thought something. He works outside our industry. I've, I've watched him work in tourism, do some data work. But I said, what, what? How would you frame the most important questions to ask AI? You know, where do you think it will have the biggest impact in tourism? And I was kind of shocked. He literally didn't miss a beat and he just started rattling them off. He said, well, think about the major challenges you face over tourism, sustainability, economic dependence and dispersion, cultural erosion, infrastructure strain, tech adoption, privacy, and government. He just, he just listened. I thought, wow, what a great way to look at this. It does have not just an impact, potential impact, but a potential massive impact in those areas. Because they right now, they are big, unsolvable problems. All right. Who wants to go to first? Talk to me about the future. Give her. Me, because I have been thinking uh, <laughs> about this a lot, specifically that where AI has huge potential is thinking of it as a management consultant. So I was speaking to Connor Brennan, it could have been a year ago now. Uh, he was the Dean of Students at NYU at the Stern School of Business. And he has since, he has now uh, been promoted or moved into a role leading AI adoption and in institution for Stern. And he's like, this is a technology that could absolutely put management consultants out of business because it's entire, it's looking for patterns and data and applying frameworks to information in order to make sense of it. That is what a business management consultant does. Here is a problem I am having with my business and it will send however many people to go through, see what data do you have that the consultants can put into a framework to solve your problem. So it's not to say we even have all of the data or ability to solve something like over tourism, but to use AI as a tool in that, to sit down and say, all right, I'm, you know, I'm in Barcelona and this is what we're up against. And like, let's take this back to first principles of like, what do we need? What information do you need for me to find for you to start helping us come up with a framework to think about this problem? And what? And, and it's going to get smarter and better. And it's going to get way smarter. I mean, right now, the my best my imaginative mind can come up with is, okay, if over tourism is an issue and AI is good at dispersion, then obviously somewhere in the intersection of those two things exists an answer. It's going to get more complex than that too, though. But you can, you can, I, I can see that. Cody, I have all those things, over tourism, sustainability, economy, infrastructure. What do you see? I, I mean, I see all of it as, as being integral. The other big piece is consumer behavior. So we look at right now, I mean, Google is gutting the web and search is fundamentally changing. Uh, our websites, are they going to become, instead of brick and mortar stores, are they Amazon warehouses where bots are simply going and scraping the information? And if tourism organizations are measuring their efficacy on website traffic and leads to partners, that's going to be going away very quickly and it's going to be disruptive. So we need to figure out a better way to tell our story and to show value to our members. Well, well let's talk about that because Jeanette, in that article, the focus wire article on the role, you made a really definitive statement. So, you know, DMOs don't have a role in booking engines in your opinion, in your, especially in your situation, NYC, right? I think it's a really good point. And Cody, you're, you are, 
probably the most you know focused marketer I know on AI. So at the same time, I see this: the modern consumer comes through a channel that we own one out of ten times nowadays. You know, it does it, it doesn't come in always through the DMO website. The operator out there has a business, and their biggest problem when they don't do business is they're not shareable enough or they're not shared. And there's usually small technical reasons that are not shareable or shared. So I look to a future of engagement, and we all know that one of the most pressing forces that we have, and, and I think you're dealing with five boroughs, Jeanette, is that? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Engagement is key. So it's not about as you said in the article, it's not about shifting monies and resources to other places away from marketing. Making people highly shareable and highly shared is marketing. It's the absolute base of marketing. So if it's a technological improvement for a small operator to fix their GMB listing, that's actually making them more shareable and more shared. That stuff has just got to get so much easier in an AI-driven world because those are all hygiene things. So I, I yeah. see the I see the role and function of the DMO and say, well, okay, so back to that education role. Yeah, a lot of it is helping these people be more shareable and shared. That opens up a whole world of possibility in AI, in marketing, in asset development, in co-investment. Um, I'm encouraged by it. Where, where do you see the biggest sort of next five-year potential in AI? And some of this stuff, you know, massive uh, over-tourism crowd rerouting. It may not be immediately here, but it might be one of the more pressing problems. What do you see? Yeah, I think in terms of big data, that's the next piece is that that dashboarding and storytelling. So being able to actually use historical data to create predictions. So even looking at when you're looking at yield or when you're looking at dispersion, being able to understand where your peaks are, where your crunch periods are within your destination, but being able to use that predictive algorithm to anticipate and therefore potentially mitigate those crunch times by getting messaging out to your various visitors and stakeholders and customers to better offset. Uh, the other piece I think that comes to mind is destination management. We now have so much intel that can actually inform where and when um, and what types of products destinations can create to make their destination more resilient as well. So I would say in addition to the consumer piece on, on the search side, this, this being able to actually tell a story through data is going to be a real tangible outcome in the very near future. Okay, so changing gears but staying in the same pond, the veracity of data becomes a question for me. And I'm going to put it to you this way, Jeanette. Um, you're, you're actually invested right now in, a, in, a, in a, an advanced governance course on AI. A lot of that has to do with veracity. Are we ever going to see a blockchain type validation of data to go along with AI so we're not hallucinating? So we know we're not hallucinating or we know what sources are? How does that work? Yeah, people are actually working on different... I don't know if it's blockchain attached to veracity because... Remember, like a large language model is a hallucination machine at it is at its core. That it, it is not designed to be Google and to guide you to sources. It is designed to predict, you know, given all of the words that have ever been put into a sentence, what word might be the next in your sentence that you need. And that that has no relationship whatsoever to the truth. And you kind of the more you the, the more you try to make your model truthful, the more you are giving up on the thing that makes it a large language model, right? It's it's as you turn down the hallucinations and turn up the truth, you are turning down the creativity. Is, is it not fair to think of it as, as a footnote in, a, in an essay, though, the, the, to just being able There are absolutely. So you can use RAG or fine tuning to to inject your version of truth into the language models. And so RAG is treating your data like a library. Got and it. so it knows, oh, I am, you know, like the web, the chat bot on your website that so many folks are moving towards. It knows, oh, somebody is asking a question about transportation. Let me pick the transportation book out of the library. And if the answer I'm looking for isn't in this book, then I will make it up. I will make up the answer. But if it is in that book, then you know, we're in good shape. Here's the cat. I don't know if we are being, uh, if this is a video recording too, but 
my cat would like to join your the cat, conversation. Your, your, your cat will get, is your cat an actor? Do we have to pay scale on it or what? Oh, yeah. No, there I'm making is. a lot of money off the cat. There it is. There it is. Crazy cat. Oh, that sounds like a, there I am. never mind. <laughs> uh, so, um, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you go to, you know, um, final thoughts on AI and stuff. But I, I read something this morning that killed me. And someone was talking about standing behind someone in line at Starbucks and they order a combination that in calls that it, they ordered a combination of drinks that involved tall vente grand, double pump, four shots, espresso, half oat, milk, nonfat, soy milk, milk, milk with it was it was a it was a order for the uh, team at the office, apparently, from a pike position with two half twists. And somebody else okay. did the permutation and said, there are 170,000 possible drink combinations at Starbucks. Somebody else said, mm, the internet seems to put that at a much higher number. But anyway, do you think AI will help Starbucks reach productivity through 170,000 possible cup combinations? Because apparently they're backing up at the till. Yeah. I, so, I mean, certainly can look at what past orders have been delivered from a particular store and know where to, like, it could provide advice on this is where you need to set the different syrups so that it is, you spend less time refilling them, maybe. Or, you know, this is how now, you need to now, prep now in the morning. Giving, now you're giving me visions of the paint counter at Home Depot. You're just going to go in and they're going to punch it in and something's going to inject into your cup. Come on, that's where it's going. <laughs> That that wouldn't stop it. I mean, Starbucks would make more money, right? If they could figure that out, it's like the what do they call the soda machines where it's it's instead of different dispensers, it's yes. just one dispenser yeah. and you press the button. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, all right, listen, um, I do so appreciate you coming and talking to us. I, I can't say enough that I know, and I, I know this from talking to people, we all appreciate the work you do to help us get on ramp. And I'm gonna take your um suggestion to heart i will open a second browser window that is strictly this because i i feel like a luddite talking to you guys but i so thank you for to helping us get there um really important though final thoughts i mean we'll be back at this in 10 months and it'll be completely different again i mean in the last 10 months things have popped up like we're running out of you know accessible data to train on and things like that which is you just you don't anticipate that right um it, from the productivity perspective, it probably is one of the biggest boons, but it's also becoming one of the most biggest stock market boondoggles in terms of, you know, now there's seven companies, which pretty much if one of them moves in the U.S. stock market, the stock market changes. It's it's really like watching the tulip uh, stocks or something like that right now. Anyway, final thoughts. Who wants to go th first? Uh, I can go and maybe Jeanette can close it out with her wealth of knowledge. I would say uh, one of the biggest tips for anybody is um, speak to ChatGPT, use the voice function because it is so much more intuitive uh, in terms of what you want to achieve, how you speak versus how you type. And if you start doing that, it really does become like another coworker that can help you. And it's it done in a conversational format. You can do things like role play, you can um, bounce ideas off of it, all the same things you can do with prompting, but in my opinion, faster and also better because you're able to just brainstorm and it's able to dictate uh, very, very, very quickly and efficiently. Um, but I would say um, break down your job into tasks, into competencies, start small and go from there. And the time is now, we have an opportunity to really gain some leverage within the industry uh, because not everybody is is using it because of that fear. Okay, and then and one last reminder: we are currently at a time when it's language models that are driving this. But AI has been around for decades in various forms. Um, AI, the Internet of Things, large language models together. I mean, it is it is massive disruption. Um, closing thoughts, Jeanette. Uh, let your mission guide you. So when you are thinking about, oh no, I'm not getting enough traffic to my website, sending traffic to your website is not your mission. Right? Our mission is you know, spreading the good word of the vibrancy of the five boroughs of New York City around the world and driving you know, economic benefits for you know, businesses and residents of New York City. So nothing in that says website traffic. So if that means we're now thinking of generative AI as one of our target audiences, maybe, where they are, you know, things that are on your website, 
This is a new audience that you have to create the, the content for. You need to make sure that it's searchable, you know, by these language models that they're able to ingest the information in a way that it is able to accomplish your mission. Like you have, you have to ladder it back up to the mission. Well, then there's a whole other series of podcasts there on, on what I think our friend Gabe Goche brought up, which was the idea of data integrity, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a whole, I mean, that's a, that's a part even from the AI models themselves. And, and I'm going to tell you, my personal take on it is, even though we started data binding 20 years ago, we really haven't cleaned up a lot of the data we have. <laughs> the bulk of it is still sitting in heaps. Yeah. No, I'm like simple views in a great place to help destinations with that. I'm I'm looking forward to what you guys are able to do. I'm really excited by it because as we start to experiment there, some there are some really remarkable things, which is sometimes the most leverageable data is tiny. It's small. It's 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 20 data points. And and you know, intuitively, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, it would be massive, you know. Um you know, massive data sets that showed trend, it's small things, you know, and I, I, I guess the analogy is someone rings your doorbell and says, Hey, your house is on fire. You don't say, I need a second opinion. You know, it's small pieces of data sometimes. Anyway, thanks for that. Yeah. You know, it, it's very exciting. It's also keeps you up at night though, thinking, where do you go next? But I, I, the last thing you said is so important. And as we're working in Europe, it's becoming more and more apparent, whatever the technology, if you're not using it to drive your mission what are you doing right then then it's just a toy or a distraction mm-hmm. yeah well and 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 thanks again and let's let's make a point here you neither of you is talking about this being a toy or a distraction you no. put it into your everyday lives it's become a, a useful tool if i told you you could never have this again or you could never have rye toast which one would you choose <laughs> <laughs> Who needs rye? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Good, good, good. No, listen, I really appreciate it. Um, let's let's circle back on this one. Thanks again to both of you. Thanks, Thank you. Dave.